It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Claire McIndoe. Uh, Claire's um, been researching Dr. Turbot, the New Zealand radio doctor, for her PhD, which she tells me is pretty much complete, which is great. Uh, just about to write up, or you have written yeah. up, I guess, which is great. Editing, lots of editing and proofreading. <laughs> okay, that's really good. So uh, she's now going to tell us the, uh, the fruits of her research, Dr. Turbot and New Zealand radio doctor, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first up, thank you very much for having me. I hope that many of you will find this talk interesting. Uh, I will be covering... It's a bit difficult for people to hear, I gather. Do we have so, a microphone? No, we do. Chris, can we use this? Okay, so... There we go. There you are. All right. Oh, very loud. Can I adjust that if that's too loud? Is that? Oh, it's all good. All right. Okay. Let us begin. Uh, so, as has already been said, this is a talk based off my thesis, my PhD thesis, which is looking at Dr. Turbot, who is the New Zealand radio doctor. Uh, this is a very broad overview. Uh, there's a lot of content. He talked for 40 years on the radio, so this is really just touching on some key themes. And I'm going to end my timeline in 19, around 1965 when Dr. Turbot left the Department of Health, although he did continue to talk on the radio until 1984. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end, so if there's anything that I touch on or I don't answer that you really want to know about, please do ask me. I, I really just don't have time to cover everything. It's such a wealth of, of material and different health topics. It's absolutely incredible what I've managed to look at. Um, so yeah, just please feel free to ask me as many questions as you want at the end. I do genuinely love talking about this topic, which is great considering I've spent three years on it so far. Uh, <laughs> so what I hope to show you from this talk is that Dr. Turbot had a unique role as a midpoint between issues of health that were of concern to the Department of Health and those that were of concern to the wider public. This was facilitated by his role as a long-running radio doctor. Through his talks, we are able to assess what the Department of Health considered to be the most pressing and publicly accessible health issues of the mid-20th century. Dr. Turbot's employment by the government to broadcast on matters of health can be considered an extension of the Labour government's view that state-owned radio had a civic duty to inform and educate the public, bettering the lives of listeners. However, Turbot's talks were also informed by what the public thought to be the most relevant health issues to them, often articulated through fan mail sent to Turbot and requests for particular health topics to be discussed. To understand the role of Dr. Turbot and his Radio Doctor program within the mid-20th century, it's first important to understand the cultural significance of radio and the legitimization of radio as a source of education and information prior to his arrival on air. Most people are familiar with the medium of radio these days, now an easily accessible form of entertainment and information. In an increasingly digital age, radio can now be consumed in new and previously unimaginable formats, including digital streaming services. In contrast, when broadcasting was first officially licensed for in New Zealand, there were low expectations by the government regarding whether radio would be widely accepted by the public. However, by the end of the 1920s, radio was a popular form of entertainment among the wider population, with rapidly increasing rates of radio license purchasing within New Zealand. Radio helped connect a widely dispersed and sometimes geographically isolated population creating a shared sense of culture and nationalism. From 1927 onwards, broadcasting hours continued to extend in response <coughs> to public demand for more content. Morning and afternoon broadcasting allowed women to become the dominant consumers for radio programming. Radios were a common domestic feature within the home, providing a sense of companionship for housewives and a distraction from the monotony and sometimes arduous nature of daily housework. 
The radio record, the official radio guide from 1927 to 1939, shows an increasingly feminized content schedule, including programs such as afternoon tea music and the Women's Hour program, which contained music women were believed to want to hear, as well as inf informative talks on suitable topics, such as cooking and homemaking. This reflect, reflects similar trends found in other Western countries, including Britain through the British Broadcasting Corporation, or BBC, which the New Zealand government looked to for guidance. Much of the women's content reinforced women's domestic role within the home, encouraging an idealised domesticity. Educational broadcasting was a key feature of radio during its early development, leading to associations such as the Workers' Education Association, the University of Otago Home Science Extension Service, and the Association for Country Education, using the radio as an educational resource. Radio broadcasts of lecturettes and, lecturettes and talks on educational subjects allowed for learning within the home. This was of particular advantage to both housewives and those who lived in remote rural areas. Women were targeted for further education in scientific domesticity, with the University of Otago's Home Science Extension Service the first official educational body to use radio to educate women in the home, beginning in 1929. Rural women were considered the main target audience, viewed as the most in need of education in domestic science. However, it is likely that women in urban areas also took advantage of these radio lessons. The Home Science Extension Service lectured on materials such as sewing, cooking, and basic health care. The Extension Service found dressmaking to be their most popular course due to its practical value for women. The government further legitimised the use of radio for educational purposes through the introduction of educational broadcasting for school students in April 1931. Working in conjunction with the already established correspondence school, and allowing for the extension of subjects taught in rural schools. New Zealand's first Labour government, elected in 1935, helped to further legitimise radio broadcasting as a medium for official communication and information through the implementation of parliamentary broadcasting. This allowed New Zealanders to listen to parliamentary debates and discussions and make informed decisions on each party without influence from media outlets. Michael Joseph Savage, Prime Minister of the time, believed that political transparency and easy access to political material would allow New Zealand's citizens to engage with their political representatives. Initiated in April 1936, they were the first broadcasts of their kind within the Commonwealth and reportedly had a large following. Radio's significance as a medium for efficient nationwide communication was highlighted by the government's choice to announce New Zealand's entry into World War II over the radio. Broadcasting the announcement allowed for both urban and rural populations to be notified at the same time across the country, regardless of how remotely someone may live. Radio broadcasting would continue to play an important role in New Zealand during the Second World War, as citizens experienced a broader impact on the home front than in World War I. In Britain and New Zealand, radio broadcasting was used to boost morale, keep the public informed, and maintain connections between those at home and soldiers fighting abroad, through special broadcasts. Government control of radio expanded in response to the war, and tighter censorship rules were put in place, restricting what content could be broadcast. The health of the nation was placed placed at risk by the outbreak of World War II and ensuing implementation of rationing, while pre-existing health and, and developmental issues within the adult population were revealed due to the physical examination enlisted soldiers had to un undergo. The Social Security Act of 1938 had allowed greater <coughs> access to health care for all. However, the war caused a drain on the nation's resources Therefore, actions needed to be taken to reduce governmental expenditure so as to fund the war effort. The war also reduced the number of medical professionals in New Zealand, with, as many were seconded into the armed forces. Report, governmental reports from 1943 indicated that only approximately one-third of those, those medical officers with practicing certificates remained in New Zealand. 
leading to a shortage of doctors, general practitioners and specialists, while the number of available hospital, hospital beds was also reduced. One way pressure could be removed from the medical service was to shift from curative to preventative medicine and through teaching the New Zealand public on how to maintain health and prevent illness. Public health education had previously been undertaken by the Department of Health during the interwar period. However, the Great Depression had limited the availability of resources for this program, leading to health education efforts varying greatly between regions. External organisations, such as the, the Home Science Extension Service, attempted to fill some of the void, predominantly focusing on the new science of nutrition. However, this led to conflicting or misinformation. This was particularly associated with women's magazines and often by advertisers of nutritional supplements, a phenomenon not limited to New Zealand. Nutrition increased in importance due to the implementation of rationing and the loss of transatlantic shipping. Therefore, wives and mothers needed to understand what their family required nutritionally and how to feed them correctly. Dietary surveys undertaken prior to the war by the Nutrition Research Department indicated that nutrition knowledge was generally lacking, with many diets considered to be nutritionally inadequate. In general, the dietary surveys showed that New Zealanders consumed high levels of sugar, predominantly in the form of baked goods, and lacked calcium due to a nationwide preference for cream and butter over milk and cheese. Concerns began to be raised by the Department of Health that the health of the nation may decline due to a rise in deficiency diseases linked to poor nutrition. These were proliferated by a lack of nutritional knowledge and the implementation of rationing. Children were considered the most susceptible to deficiency diseases, with the potential for lifelong issues as a result. The importance of the child was heightened during the war due to the need to preserve the family unit and perception that children were the next generation of soldiers, manufacturers and mothers, ensuring New Zealand's future. In 1941, the Department of Health began to educate the public on matters of health through the creation of an Advice on Health column within the popular listener magazine and radio guide. Begin beginning in May, these columns were written by two Department of Health officials, Dr Muriel Bell, New Zealand's first state-appointed nutritionist, and Dr Harold B. Turbot, Director of the Division of School Hygiene. Both these doctors had witnessed the impact of poor nutrition on child health, while Dr. Bell had long been an advocate for making the science of nutrition easily accessible and understandable for a broad audience. Also of note, Dr. Turbot had a vested interest in the health of the Māori, having authored New Zealand's first in-depth report on Māori incident rates of tuberculosis. Doctors Turbot and Bell alternated weeks for publication, with Bell focusing on nutrition and practical food advice, while Turbot covered issues of health and illness. We can infer that their column was most likely well received, as it was replicated as a once-weekly broadcast, presented by an anonymous Department of Health employee. These weekly broadcasts aired during the mid-morning, generally between 11 and 11.30 a.m., over the national YA channel which predominantly tried to cater to a more highbrow audience. Radio broadcasting allowed the Department of Health to undertake health education of the public without needing to rely on print materials, which were difficult to produce due to paper rationing. The listener column and weekly talk remained the department's main source of mass public outreach until mid-1943. In June 1943, the National Commercial Broadcasting Service underwent a massive shape-up when the head of the division, Colin Scrimdraw, also known as Uncle Scrim, was fired from his position. Scrimdraw had enjoyed an enormously popular early morning broadcast time slot for several years on the major commercial ZB channels, from which he regularly broadcast health advice. Although not medically, tra medically trained, Scrimdraw had used health techs and the advice of experts to create his own scripts for these talks, some of which offered health advice that was in contrast to what the Department of Health promoted, causing concern within the department. 
With his sudden removal, there was a need to fill the popular early morning time slot, and fast. The Department of Health was keen to expand the reach of their health education broadcasts by securing a portion of the popular time slot. While the commercial channel itself was aimed at a more general audience and considered to be more popular overall with consumers, particularly in regional areas. It is worth noting that at this time, it was estimated that approximately 89% of households owned a radio. By taking the commercial channel time slot, the Department of Health committed themselves to expanding their public health outreach, broadcasting health material six days a week to a broader audience base than before. This increase in frequency would help to keep health concerns at the forefront of the nation's mind. Given the quantity of broadcasts required, doctors Bell and Turbot were approached to write these three-minute talks due to their previous experience writing for the listener, while Turbot was asked to record them for broadcast. Dr. Turbot was only asked to lend his voice for a temporary period, presumably until another presenter could be found. However, this interim measure ended up lasting over 40 years. Unusually, Dr. Turbot was openly known as the radio doctor and voice behind these talks, a situation allowed by his governmental position as opposed to being in private practice, therefore not having the ability to gain from his broadcasting fame. Dr. Charles Hill, the British equivalent of the radio doctor, was forbidden from associating himself with his radio persona by the British Medical Association, due to the potential for his private practice to benefit financially. Dr. Turbot's broadcasts on the commercial channel entitled Talks on Health, Very Creative, uh, began in June 1943 and covered a wide range of health, nutritional and childhood issues that might threaten to disrupt public health during the war. Wives and mothers were the perceived audience for these talks. Therefore, topics that might not fit within a public health mandate were still covered so as to appeal to these listeners and offer support during a period of upheaval. For instance, bedwetting might not be considered a public health topic. However, this was an issue that could cause stress for both mothers and children. Therefore, it was regularly addressed within the broadcast schedule. Dr. Turbot's broadcast slot of 7.30 in the morning ensured that there was a high likelihood that the target audience would be able to hear it whether based within the home or having been manpowered into the essential industries. Women were the guardians of family health, and it was their war duty to maintain health and convey health ideals to their children. Therefore, these were important talks for them to hear. Talks discussing the care of the elderly were relevant to intergenerational families, while knowledge about occupational health and safety helped to protect workers and maintain high levels of productivity in the essential industries. Talks on nutrition, written by Dr. Bell, contributed towards a large portion of the total number of talks given during the war period, of which there was over 930. This was a direct consequence of the war due to the implementation of rationing and loss of transatlantic shipping. Talks on nutrition covered what vitamins were, as well as why they were needed, and what the consequences were if one was to be deficient in them. Discussions were held about how to include vitamins in the diet in the correct quantities and how best to cook and serve nutritional meals. Uh, cabbage was particularly featured because apparently people would boil it for over half an hour. Because of Dr. Bell's dedication to practical science, these nutrition talks offered practical advice on how to feed the family. Vegetables should not be overcooked nor have bicarbonate of soda added to the water to make them appear greener. And raw salads should be enjoyed whenever in season, as long as the components were freshly prepared before being served. The loss of orange imports and vitamin C from California led to Dr. Bell suggesting that mothers made rosehip syrup to ensure that their children received the correct amount of vitamin C in the diet. However, Many mothers wrote and complained to Dr. Bell that her recipes were too time-consuming and too difficult to make. Fussy eaters were not to be encouraged, particularly when rationing already made mother's job of feeding the family that much harder. 
Dr. Turbot provided plenty of advice for parents dealing with fussy children. Proper child feeding requires regularity, no fuss at all, balanced meals and patience. Remember, no child comes to harm by refusing to eat and don't fuss. Talks on diet, feeding the family, food hygiene and mealtime rituals were particularly well placed for the audience reception given the broadcast time of 7.30am. When the wife or mother may have been sitting down for the first meal of the day with her family or preparing breakfast and thinking about those meals to come. Food and nutrition was an important aspect of the home and raising children and in turn warranted the large portion of Dr. Turbot's talks on health that it occupied. Child health and development was the other major concern during the war. Children were the future and as such needed to be moulded into the citizens of tomorrow, both physically and psychologically. Childhood development topic, topics covered by Turbot included sibling je jealousy, adolescent development, naughtiness and the overattached child. Certain mental deficiencies were believed to come from incorrect parenting, such as nervousness, speech impediments and overdependency. Parents must let children gradually detach themselves from home dependence. Over-sheltering and over-mothering makes wit-charactered emotional adults, warned Dr. Turbot, highlighting the belief that the actions of the parents, particularly the mother, during infancy and early childhood could have a lifelong impact on the child and their development into a healthy adult. Dr. Turbot also covered many ordinary topics, such as bedwetting, growing pains, and eczema. While these may not have been pressing health issues, educating listeners would keep them from unnecessarily calling upon the doctor and added to Dr. Turbot's broad appeal to parents. In discussing the ordinary, everyday health issues, Dr. Turbot provided a sense of support for parents during a difficult time of uncertainty. Many mothers were undertaking solo parenting for the first time, leading to an increased stress due to a reduced support system. Dr. Turbot's talks were an attempt to alleviate some aspect of the stress and reassure mothers that they were doing their best during a difficult time. An interesting emphasis during the war period was placed on feet and footwear. Uh, as a direct response to the medical examination recruits underwent, underwent during enlistment. Many recruits were ineligible to fight overseas due to foot troubles believed to have occurred because of ill-fitting footwear worn as a child. It was considered a national embarrassment to have such a large number of men not able to serve due to preventable issues, and the department wanted to make sure that these would not occur in the new generation. The Department of Health was not above using guilt tactics to reinforce their message either. You may think it's their own fault. Well, you're wrong. It's not their fault at all. It's their parents' shortcomings which are responsible. Dr. Turbot and the department made clear guidelines that mothers could follow when fitting and purchasing shoes for their children. The number one issue was children wearing footwear that was too tight an issue that could easily present itself due to the rationing of leather and footwear, and the mothers trying to force longevity out of items of footwear that were not worn out. The extended discussion broadcast joke regarding correctly fitted footwear reflect Dr. Turbot and the Department of Health's interest in issues raised by the war, and the preventable nature of many defects that emerged in childhood. <coughs> Dr. Turbot's radio talks were used by the Department of Health to directly target the rural population for the first time. Approximately 43% of the total population were classed as rural dwelling prior to the war. The department viewed the rural population as having separate and distinct health needs which were exaggerated due to the war. Accessibility to medical services was further restricted for the rural population due to petrol rationing while having to navigate the reduction in available medical professionals. Rural women had already faced increasing scrutiny during the 1930s regarding their perceived lack of domestic knowledge and ability to parent correctly. One of the reasons for the increased scrutiny was because rural families did not tend to conform to expect, expected gender roles, 
with women playing an important role in the running of the farm. Pre-war surveys indicated that over half the nation's dairy farming wives worked 25 to 45 hours a week on top of their expected domestic duties. Rural women were scolded for not paying enough attention to raising their children. Yet during the war period, their involvement in the farm became even more crucial as agriculture became an essential industry. New Zealand also lacked the same land girl participation as experienced in Britain. Therefore, some rural women were dealing with a lack of adequate support on the farm. Dr. Turbot's health broadcasts were useful as they did not require rural, rural women to actively seek out instruction in health, instead bringing health education into the home. By making this modern knowledge easily accessible, the Department of Health hoped that more rural women would avail themselves of this service. It was believed that rural women were the key to dealing with many of the health issues rural families faced due to their lifestyle. The rural population was considered to be at greater risk of zoonosis, animal to human disease transmission, due to their close contact with large numbers of farm animals. Dr. Turbot frequently talked about the potential health risks farmers face due to improper care when handling livestock. Human hydatid disease had been a specifically rural concern raised during the interwar years due to the number of dogs found in the farming community and their access to hydatid infested food sources, such as infected sheep, liver and lungs. However, there had never been an extensive public health campaign regarding the matter due to fears over misunderstandings regarding the disease transmission. The government was concerned that overseas markets may not wish to import New Zealand land if they knew the extent of hydatid infection within herds. The war and associated loss of export markets due to shipping restrictions allowed hydatid disease to be openly discussed for the first time. Many of those who were hospitalised due to hydatids were believed to have been initially infected during childhood. Therefore, rural children needed to be educated by their mothers on how to prevent potential transmission. Rural mothers were urged to encourage healthy hand-washing habits as children will fondle dogs and touch the animals and crawl about, so both the farmer and his child will get infected fingers. However, it is the child who put these, puts these into his mouth. Young children were believed to instinctively want to play with animals and offer them affection. Therefore, mothers needed to enforce hand washing and ensure that no dog was to lick their child. Healthy habits regarding hand washing developed as a child would serve them well in the future when they became adults. Dr. Turbot also frequently discussed the perils of milk-borne diseases, such as bovine tuberculosis and undulant fever, and the implementation of milk pasteurization as a preventative measure. While some cities, notably Wellington, already had milk pasteurization available, urban, wo urban women were reluctant to forego their raw milk and needed to be encouraged to switch to pasteurized milk, as raw milk could not be guaranteed to be clean and disease-free. Although farmers could get their herds tested for bovine tuberculosis every six months, it was difficult to eradicate due to reinfection from wild possums. In 1945, milk-borne tuberculosis was associated with 187 deaths. The majority of rural mothers did not have the option of pasteurized milk available, even if they should want it, and were required to pasteurize their milk at home so as to protect the family from milk-borne diseases. This task could be arduous and time-consuming, particularly if rural mothers were required to commit to pasteurizing the milk each morning. Both urban and rural populations needed to be reminded of the value of, of pasteurization and the dangers milk could pose, despite also being promoted as an almost perfect food source by Dr. Bell. Farmers faced further risk of animal-human disease transmission from the act of milking the cow. Therefore, cleanliness for both farmer and animal at all stages of milking was important. Dr. Turbot urged farmers to practice appropriate hygiene measures, both for the benefit of themselves and for their families. These measures included thorough hand washing after handling any animals, especially sick ones, and particularly before consuming any food, much like the advice that was given regarding preventing the spread of hydatid disease. 
Reminders were also given about the importance of cleanliness in the milk shed. Farmers were expected to make sure that all udders were washed with clean water before milking, and all milking utensils were well washed and kept to a high standard of cleanliness. Although pasteurization could make milk safe from disease, it did not clean milk, so therefore milk that was received from the farmers dirty would continue to taste dirty even after being heat treated. The talks that Drs. Turbot and Bell produced during the 1943 to 1946 period reflect, directly reflected the public health issues that the Department of Health believed to be most pressing, often as a result of the war itself and the wider impact it had on the New Zealand public. The major focus on food and nutrition was impl influenced by the implementation of rationing and the growing understanding of how nutrition and health were connected, a knowledge that needed to be passed on to the wider public. Poor nutrition in childhood could have long-lasting consequences, ones that the government wished to avoid if New Zealand was to have a strong future post-war. A healthy child could lead to a healthy adult. Therefore, it was important for parents to be armed with knowledge on how to best facilitate appropriate child health and development. Although I have emphasised these two areas of discussion, which reflects the large focus that Drs. Turbot and Bell placed on these issues, disease was still frequently discussed. Penicillin was not widely available until after the war, despite the first shipments coming from Australia in February 1944. Therefore, disease was still a major threat to life. Prevention of disease was key, therefore hand washing and good nutrition were believed to be important in helping to guard against illness. Occupational health was another area of discussion that reflected the influence of wartime necessity. However, talks on this topic were considerably less frequent and tended to be more specific in what they addressed. Of particular interest, however, were discussions aimed at factory owners and foremen regarding the entry of women into manufacturing plants. Dr. Turbot gave warning that equipment that had been designed for men had been designed for men, therefore special consideration needed to be given to the suitability of the environment for women and adjustments made as necessary. This included providing women with seating and increased rest breaks because they might get more tired than men when using the machinery. A healthy workforce was a productive workforce. And as the war drew to an end and those who had served overseas began to return home, Dr. Turbot's health talks began to shift in focus. A greater number of talks regarding prenatal and infant care began to be included within Turbot's broadcast schedule, reflecting the increasing birth rate that New Zealand would experience during the post-war period. In June 1946, Dr. Turbot ended his three-year run of broadcasts. An announcement in the listener reported that Dr. Turbot's health talks had ended temporarily due to the need to travel overseas on what Turbot himself would later term a fact-finding mission. Despite the advertised temporary nature of Turbot's departure from radio, it was not until 1952 that the radio broadcasts returned. Dr. Turbot's return saw a change in format on these talks, now longer in length, allowing greater depth of discussion, but only broadcast once a week at 11 a.m. on a Saturday. Once again, Dr. Turbot's radio talks were prompted by a national threat to health, creating a need for a far-reaching health education scheme. Although the 1950s were considered a period of national prosperity, with low unemployment rates and increasing, and increasing wages, the health of the nation remained in crisis throughout this decade, in a sharp contrast to how the period is normally perceived. Antibiotics gave a false sense of security, with many diseases still remaining a threat to health, while new health issues arose due to the nation's increasing wealth and extension of life expectancy. Poliomyelitis was considered a considerable threat to child welfare during the 1950s, becoming the catalyst for Turbot's return to the air. Incident rates of poliomyelitis were on the rise in New Zealand in 1952, only three years after the last epidemic causing the Department of Health to voice concerns while public fears began to rise. Previously, New Zealand had generally experienced a spike in poliomyelitis cases every 10 years or so in a cyclic fashion uh, during the summer and autumnal seasons. The epidemic of 1952, beginning in winter, was unforeseen, with no indicator as to why the 10-year cycle had been broken. 
This led to fears that poliomyelitis epidemics may become a yearly threat, as experienced in America. The baby boom was well underway at this point, increasing New Zealand's population size, with no signs of slowing down. As poliomyelitis predominantly affected children and those under the age of 20, this growing proportion of the population was placed at increased risk of ill health and potential for paralysis or death. Dr. Turbot was prompted to return to the radio so that he could act as an informant for the public, helping them to feel reassured that the Department of Health was taking proactive measures to try and quell the epidemic, while also providing reminders as to the importance of basic protective measures, such as hand washing. A second polio epidemic swept to New Zealand in August 1955 through to July 1956, with an increasing number of children and adolescents affected. Dr. Turbot once again broadcast widely on the matter, advertising parents, advising parents to maintain good family hand washing regimes as a method of preventing the spread of illness. It is to have strict, a strict system of hand washing. Nobody is exempt. Throughout this period, the Department of Health had been trying to source the new salt vaccine from within the Commonwealth, no longer trusting American-produced serum after the Cutton Laboratory failed to properly inactivate the virus for the vaccine, causing children to become infected with paralytic poliomyelitis. Canada, Australia and Britain, all undertaking manufacturing within their own countries, were unable to fulfil New Zealand's request due to issues with their own supply and demand. Polio was a global threat to children, leading to high demand for the vaccine. By the end of 1956, the New Zealand government had been able to source some limited quantities of the vaccine, allowing for the Department of Health's vaccination campaign to begin, targeting five to nine-year-olds. Dr. Turbot needed to go to great lengths to assure parents of the safety of the vaccine, recognising their fears regarding the matter. The safety of the British vaccine to be used in New Zealand is as assured as humanely possible. I personally have been over to the laboratory where the vaccine for New Zealand was made. This assurance of safety needed to be emphasised after the widespread media attention given to the Cutter Laboratories incident and subsequent cases of paralytic poliomyelitis. The Department of Health was concerned that vaccine uptake rates would be low. Therefore, Dr. Turbot needed to convince parents that it was a worthwhile scheme. Dr. Turbot is portrayed as a trusted source of health advice to the wider public, providing parents with understandable information about both the disease and how to prevent it, dispelling worries about the risks of vaccination and using persuasive facts as to why vaccination was worthwhile. Parents' fears regarding polio and the education campaign in the Department of Health ran resulted in high consent rates for vaccination, with approximately 89% of parents choosing to have their five to nine-year-olds vaccinated. Public fears concerning the health and well-being of the child were particularly high during the post-war baby boom. The value of the family unit and the child was reinforced by the introduction of a universal family benefit by the Labour government in 1946, allowing families to continue to expand. This supplement to the family income facilitated some to buy into new modes of consumerism and leisure. One of the many ways in which families spent their increasing wealth was through the purchase of electric labour-saving devices for the home and motor vehicles. The result of this increase in road users was a correlated rise in the mortality rate for road accidents, including for pedestrians. Young adult males were considered the group at, high, at highest risk particularly as motorcycle ownership also rose, with some academics claiming that the high road user mortality rate is the reason why the Pākehā male life expectancy failed to rise as dramatically as anticipated after the introduction of antibiotics. Dr. Turbot spoke frequently on the need to be wary on the road, particularly if consuming alcohol or travelling over the holiday period. Unlike in Dr. Turbot's war period broadcasting, during the 1950s, Turbot tailored talks around the Christmas holiday season to address risks listeners may face while enjoying their summer holidays. These holiday topics were not just limited to discussion on road accidents and continued to be a key yearly feature of Dr. Turbot's talks until his retirement from radio in 1984. Come back from your holiday alive and unmaimed. Come back without having hurt anyone else. 
come back without a car accident. That's your task these holidays. Turbot was also an early advocate of car seat belts, having experienced the use of one while visiting, in, uh, visiting America in 1958. Not only were they safe and proven to reduce car accident mortality rates, they also allowed for passengers to enjoy a more comfortable driving experience without having to brace themselves when travelling around corners. It would not be until 1965 that it was compulsory to have seat belts fitted in the front seats of cars in New Zealand, and even then, it wasn't compulsory to wear them. Accidents in the home also came under increasing scrutiny during the 1950s, as children represented the majority of those affected and were preventable sources of injury and death. Accidents became more apparent as a source of preventable public health risk due to the declining disease mortality experienced in the post-war period. Dr. Turbot went as far as to claim in 1956 that there were 159 child deaths due to accidents for every 100 deaths from disease. And this is right after there was a massive polio epidemic as well. So, bold claim to be making. Uh, burns were the most common source of injury, with many children left permanently scarred, and these were viewed as a failing of both parents and ensuring to protect the child. Mothers were supposed to be watchful of their children around fires and other sources of heat, while fathers should make sure that fires and heaters were, had appropriate guards to protect the child. Similar dialogue has been noted as existing within Britain and being promoted by their national health system. The decline in disease mortality and general rise in prosperity also revealed a new threat to health, particularly for those who were considered middle-aged. Coronary heart disease became a rising concern during the 1950s as a consequence of lifestyle changes and increased longevity. However, very little was understood about it at this time. What was known was during this period that there was a link between being overweight, high blood pressure and an increased likelihood of heart disease. Therefore, Dr. Turbin encouraged those approaching middle age to ensure that they were exercising sufficiently and consuming a healthy diet. Stress was to be avoided if possible or dealt with in a healthy manner. It is guests that worry, emotional strain and living at too fast a pace help the hardening of the arteries, though how is not clear. It is known that strenuous exercise is unwise after 40. You are as old as your birthdays, not as young as you feel. Smoking was also considered a leisure activity at this time and believed to help reduce stress. Therefore, six to eight cigarettes a day was advocated to help the user avoid heart disease, although excessive consumption could have the opposite effect. In 1962, the British Royal College of Physicians reported a definite link between tobacco <coughs> consumption and the increased risk of mortality from certain diseases, such as lung cancer, the first of several major medical authorities to do so. This ushered in a major shift in attitude towards smoking within both the medical community and the wider public. The Department of Health had been actively trying to reduce tobacco consumption in New Zealand prior to the announcement. However, now a hardline stance was taken that any consumption was to be discouraged. At this time, Dr. Turbot was Director General of Health and actively involved in the World Health Organization. Turbot would have been involved in, if not the instigator of, the department's decision to take a hardline stance against smoking. However, he did not directly address the issue within his health talks during the 1960s. Instead, Dr. Turbot wove anti-smoking messages into his talks on cancer, bronchitis, and coronary heart disease, providing deeper context and meaning as to why citizens should not smoke, and avoiding a sense of attacking smokers directly for their habits. Turbot himself had been a modest smoker, allowing himself three to five cigarettes a day for relaxation purposes. However, he reportedly gave these up in 1962 after reading the British Royal College of Physicians report. Cigarette smoking was considered an easy change for the citizens to make for the improvement of their own health and that of those around them. While revelations regarding the impact of cigarette smoking may have shaken up societal attitudes towards the habit, conversations around sex, drugs and alcohol caused far more of a stir in the 60s. 
Six, sex education in particular had been a topic of increasing debate during the post-war period, as interested groups argued as to how much children needed to know and whose responsibility it was to educate them. The Department of Health supported the right of a parent to educate their, their own child on the matter. However, believed that this needed to be done in the correct way and with the right information at hand. Pamphlets were published by the Department of Health during the 1950s and 60s with the intention that they be used to aid parents in educating their children. However, the introduction of the contraceptive pill into New Zealand in 1961 sure saw a shift in the stance, with Dr. Turbot believing that women needed to be educated and informed by professionals before seeking access to this new form of contraception. In November 1961, Dr. Turbot planned to broadcast on what the contraceptive pill was, how it worked, and the potential side effects one might expect. Neither promoting nor discouraging the use of the pill, simply laying out the facts and urging caution be, take, be, ta be taken, given that there had been no longitudinal studies of its use conducted. Despite this approach, the census believed that the contraceptive pill was not an appropriate subject for an 11 a.m. talk on a Saturday morning, despite Turbot having broadcast on venereal disease many times during that time slot. J. H. E. Schroeder, Director of New Zealand Broadcasting Service, gave further explanation as to the censorship, citing that he should know that the Roman Catholic Church opposes all artificial means of birth control and that Roman Catholics in the audience would be gravely offended by any broadcast on the subject, more especially so by a Saturday morning session from a link of the most popular station. Schroeder went further in his explanation, explaining that, regardless of the Catholics, the subject of the script is more appropriate to consulting room discussion than to broadcast here in the kitchen. In one setting, a woman is alone with her doctor. In the other, she could be embarrassed by the presence of family or strangers. Given that New Zealand experienced a rapid uptake of the contraceptive pill, there was obvious demand that women were most likely wanting information about the contraceptive pill. Turbot's censorship is an example of one of the few times Dr. Turbot was censored and can be interpreted as a representation of perceptions of societal decency taking precedence over matters of health. His other discussions that were censored were regarding the issue of fluoridation, uh, which I could go into great depth about and is very, very interesting, but I sadly do not have time. Um, so in conclusion, Radio was an important medium for the transmission of health education and information during the mid-20th century. Educational institutions had taken advantage of radio to broadcast lecturettes during the 1930s, setting a precedence, while the first Labour government further legitimised radio as a means for official communication through their broadcasting of parliamentary debates. World War II caused the Department of Health and wider government to become increasingly concerned regarding the health of New Zealand citizens as rationing impacted food supply and enlistment exams revealed a nation that was not as healthy as once perceived. The Department of Health implemented a new form of health education as a way of improving general health and reducing the reliance on an under-resourced medical system. Employing doctors <coughs> Muriel Bell and H.B. Turbot to write an advice health, health advice column in The Listener. Their column generated a radio broadcast voiced by an anonymous employee However, when opportunity to reach a wider audience with increased frequency presented itself, the Department of Health embraced it. Through increased frequency, the Department of Health could keep health at the forefront of the nation's consciousness, while the personality and authority of a real doctor allowed for greater public engagement with the material. In response, listeners helped to shape what material was broadcast, with many writing to Dr. Turbot to request topics of discussion, which he obliged. As post-war life began to resume in 1946, Dr. Turbot left the air to focus on other areas of his job, including assessing what other countries were doing to support public health. The 1952 polio epidemic <coughs> created a reason for Dr. Turbot to return to the air, as the public needed to be reassured and re-educated as to how to prevent the spread of disease. The baby boom had placed an increased social value on the family unit and the child, Therefore, measures need to, needed to be taken to prevent child mortality, while the introduction of antibiotics in, 19, in the 1940s had given a false sense of security regarding the decline of mortality from disease. 
You see, new factors for mortality had risen in its wake, including accidents and factors associated with extended lifespans and increasing prosperity. By the 1960s, Dr. Turbot was director of the Division of Health and heavily involved in the World Health Organization. Not only did this provide Turbot with an extended overview of the health of the nation, but it also allowed him to have a say in what were the Department of Health and what were the Department of Health considered to be the most pressing health issues of the time. It was while this, in this position that Dr. Turbot best embodied a midpoint between official health concerns and those that the public considered to be the greatest threat to their well-being. Dr. Turbot's talks always encouraged listeners to take charge of their own health and provided them with practical measures that they could use to protect themselves and their families. Thank you. Truby King had been um, preaching good nutrition and the role of the, of the mother to bring up good, healthy children since he started the Plunkett Society in 1908, yep. right to 1938. <coughs> Do you see Dr. Talbot as a continuation of this or a separate movement? It's actually very interesting because there's some arguments made that Plunkett and the Division of Health didn't actually cooperate with each other. Um, this question, so during the war period, Plunkett and the Department of Health, there's actually evidence that they were working together to promote the same goals, the same issues. Uh, Dr. Bell worked for both organisations, so when she came up with rosehip syrup, she was providing that to Plunkett nurses to give to mothers, as well as promoting it through the radio, through the listener as well. Um, there are some ways that this could be considered an extension in terms of promoting very practical me methods for health, for the well-being of the child. Um, but what we see later in the 1950s is actually a shift away from lot of a lot of what Truby King promoted, particularly very rigid approaches to child-rearing, to infant welfare. So, um, for instance, mothers were allowed to give their children affection and attention. That was encouraged during the 50s and 60s, whereas during the 40s, there's more of a barrier. Uh, and also, children didn't need to be as regimented. So, Truby King, Plunkett, very big on having a regimented system, a, um, a schedule for babies, for young children. Whereas in the 50s and 60s, there's a shift away from that instead. Um, but in terms of promoting public health in a very practical way, definitely lots of... Uh, similarities and could be considered a continuation of that work. Do you feel it was a failure of the Plunkett to get the message over that women need, needed this information? Or do you just think it's an evolution from the Truby King to the Dr. Talbot just getting, as you so say, one of the technique? One of the really big critiques of Plunkett is that it only deals with infant welfare. So Turbin actually deals with, I mean, we're talking about adolescence at one point, about, you know, the dreaded teenager, which comes up more in the 50s. Um, he's dealing with the health of the elderly. He's dealing with just so many different issues as well. Um, also, Plunkett didn't really have much of a presence in rural areas. Some towns had Plunkett nurses, others didn't. Some people lived too remotely to actually access Plunkett services. So the radio... Um, allowed them to receive the same level of care as urban mothers would as well. Um, I wouldn't say it's a failure. They're targeting different audiences as well. So Plunkett would, wouldn't suit mothers once their children grow up, whereas Turbot came in and provided this extra information that would help them through the phases of toddler onwards as well. I'm just wondering if you've had the opportunity to listen to a recording of Dr. Turbot. So I was incredibly lucky in that I contacted the Sound and Vision Archive and they digitised a couple for me. So there's not a lot left, and certainly not from the 40s, from the war period. It just didn't... Um, it wasn't kept in the fact that... So during the 40s, actually, very. I think this is interesting, um, but he would record in Wellington and the talks would be shipped around the country because there wasn't a joint link. So you couldn't hear the same thing across the country. Instead... The programming would be the same, but it was rotated between the four main stations. Um, 
So there's some talks that actually exist from the 60s and the 70s, and also the Spectrum interview that he gave in 1984 exists online in full, an hour and a half of Turbot talking. Uh, very interesting career as well. If you're at all interested, it's very easy to access. Um, yeah, just crazy interesting life this guy has had, which sadly I don't really get a chance to talk on in my thesis. But his career prior to joining the Department of Health, um, he actually studied down here, of course. Uh, he went over to China as a medical missionary. The Boxer Uprising happened. He gets he runs off to Hong Kong for safety, ends up being a tram driver because all the local Chinese were um, on strike. So he's driving a tram, he's got a tram license. Someone tries to blow up his tram, so he has to run to the back and hit the, bo the bomb off the back of the tram, explodes in the street. He includes all of this in great detail. It's really, really fascinating. Um, yeah, and he's just had a lifelong passion for public health and for improving the quality of life for so many people. So. Really fascinating. I just, sorry, I just want to quickly say, I just wonder about that in particular, that you've used a couple of recordings to, I was wondering about his tone, you know, was it um, kind of, you, you must do this and it's a bit curative, or was it conversational? It's, I would classify it as more of a conversational tone, and certainly I am really lucky in that he kept all the transcripts of his talks mm -hmm. and they were donated to the Alexander Turnbull. So if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have a thesis. And I've looked at all of them. Um, there's over two and a half thousand and I've read them all, uh, <laughs> which is why it's just so difficult to cover everything. Uh, there's just so much content and so many things that are just interesting little talks. But his tone is very conversational. He is always referring to being asked, like, if someone is talking to me, I had a letter about this issue, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, I overheard these people on the street who were just had terrible misinformation, so I'm going to correct it. Um, and he would try and bring up examples from his own life as well. So, uh, for instance, with tuberculosis, it was sort of his own, his own passion, his own crusade was to uh, end or reduce rates of tuberculosis in New Zealand, particularly for Māori, uh, and he would bring up things such as, in my, back in my day, it was believed that this was a hereditary disease because families would get it. Um, you know, you, you'd hear about the great aunt who's got TB in the sanatorium, and he brings in that sense of personality and that casual tone, but he is authoritative when he needs to be, and he, he does kind of almost goad parents in a way like, well, it's your choice, but his very much like, this is what you should be doing, but in a, in a pleasant way. And that's why particularly when um, smoking, I make mention of it with 1962, this strong link between smoking and cancer. He doesn't directly attack smokers saying, you need to stop, you should stop. Instead, he really weaves it into other conversations so that it's more of a persuasive tone than an authoritative, this is bad tone as well. When did you say he stopped broadcasting? 1984. Uh, so March 1984, his final broadcast aired. Um, and it was partly due to age. So he was born in 1899. Uh, so he was going well into old age. There's discussions in the 70s where the Department of Health and Radio New Zealand are going, well, what do we do when we've no longer got Dr. Turbid? Because they couldn't rely on him to live forever. Uh, and he had a really popular following, but at that time you've got television which is competing for views. Um, the listener has just lost their rights to being the sole publisher of radio uh, of the radio guide, so now newspa newspapers can publish the programs. There's a massive overhaul, and Turbid just wasn't bringing in new listeners either. So although he was popular with established audiences, the young people weren't tuning in to listen to his health advice. I never known him from Dr. Turbot once. Really? Yes, I was the senior health educator of the National Heart Foundation, uh -huh. which I established in 1978. And it was about that time for the next two years I got the phone call. It was in Heart Week, and they were focusing on um, uh, controlling high blood pressure. And uh, he wanted to know what the party line was with the Heart Foundation. So I was able to tell him, and then he broadcasted the following week 
My husband said, did you keep in touch with her? Because people used to believe everything he said. He wouldn't get this into me, but he was not. <laughs> No, um, just building on that is in the 70s and 80s his talks shift and they do talk a lot about things like the Heart Foundation but also other foundations as well and the likelihood is I will have the transcript for that talk that you provided him that advice on so if you want that transcript please let me know because I do have it and I'm more than happy to <laughs> So, uh, very interesting question. After he graduated, where did he actually work in medical practice to gain all the wisdom that he dispensed? So, he, he studied here, and this is, from a, history, from a historian's point of view, this is a really interesting actually um, point because he went over to China as a medical missionary. And in his later years, he claims that he was advised by a professor here, like, don't go back to the UK. Everyone goes back to finish their medical degrees. Go off some, somewhere else, learn some different skills. Um, but I have archival evidence of him as a 17-year-old writing to the Presbyterian Church saying, I want to be a medical missionary. Um, will you please fund my, my medical study? And then when I, when I graduate, I'll go over to China for you. So he does that, and he actually gets a couple of research contracts. So I think he's with John Hopkins at one point, mm -hmm. looking at um, hookworm in China. He's working in this tiny little village. He actually gets shot at through, he's performing surgery, and they have two villages shooting at each other, and bullets come through the glass. Um, fascinating career. Uh, and then he comes back to New Zealand and is interested in public health because of this research work he's done in China. And so he does a um, diploma in public health, I think it is, done here, or it might be a master's, something like that. And then he goes up north and he's in Gisborne. And he's also, so that's when he does his research into tuberculosis in the Māori and actually is really instrumental in improving housing in that area because he sees those links between um, poor housing and the fact that you've got people ill with tuberculosis being cared for in the same room as the rest of the family. And he's really instrumental. And he works with Princess Tipuya, who's a really important Māori leader at that time, and they improve the housing. And then he's working in Waikato. And at some point, he's also over in, I think, Samoa as well, before he ends up getting offered director of the Division of School Hygiene. So he's doing that for the Department of Health when he ends up on the radio. And then he just works his way through. So he's... Uh, he's deputy director for a long time, and then until and then in 1960 to 65, he's director general of health. But he's also involved in the World Health Organization, and he chaired the World Health Assembly, and was on their executive board as well during the 60s. You talked about vaccination So. This also changes depending on the time period. So uh, in the 1940s, it's diphtheria, and there's a massive campaign, Make Babies First Birthday Their Diphtheria Vaccination Day. And that's very much like, you should be doing this because this is good for your child, and it prevents against this. Post-war, there's a real shift in how things are spoken about, and that's why in the 1950s, there's actually a lot of fuss about milk pasteurization and about water fluoridation because it's seen as imposing upon people's rights to choose whether they're medicated by the public or um, by the government. So fluoridation is a, a really big issue then. But it, it comes down with the polio vaccination in much the same way where he goes, it's your decision, but you should be doing it for these reasons. And he says about the success that's seen in America, in the UK... Um, he talks about the World Health Organization and how they promote it as well. He says, you know, the World Health Organization has signed off on this. They say it's really wonderful. And then when you have the Sabin oral vaccine come in, he talks about that as well. So that was trial in Soviet Russia, which has um, actually led to some Western, particularly American doctors, being really skeptical about the results because Cold War, they don't trust anything that's coming out of Soviet Russia. Uh, and 
So it was trialled there, and Turbot's talking quite openly about that as well. Um, but there's a change of language between, it's called a live vaccine when they're doing the trials. When it's introduced into New Zealand, it's an oral vaccine. So you're quelling those fears about this live virus being given to your children, particularly because in 1956, you've got the Qatar incident where the virus for the vaccine wasn't, it wasn't killed properly and children got sick. So whenever he's talking about anything that's really important, it's very much persuasive. It's these are the reasons, these are the facts, this is what other countries are doing, this is what the World Health Organization is doing. Uh, and he's actually creating a very educated audience. Uh, unbelievably so, even in the 40s, he's using proper medical language. So bedwetting is in neurosis, and he calls it that. And he's, throughout his time on radio, he is explaining what medical definitions mean. So he'll use a medical term and explain it. He'll always treat them like they're knowledgeable, but make sure that they understand it as well. So he's not kind of talking down to people. He's creating an educated audience, and that actually has an effect with how the audience interacts with doctors as well. So he's creating, um, he's kind of evening, he's evening up the, the, the playing field would be kind of how I perceive it in terms of, in some ways, making the doctor's job easier and in other ways making the patients understand the doctor better. Because at the time, doctors are up here and they're gods and you believe what they say and they will never lead you wrong. And he's kind of making it so that people are less intimidated by that as well. One more question? Do we know what the sort of coverage he had um, if people did follow that advice? Can I ask another question? Do you think that could be a modern day presence? Yes, so I'll start with you first one. Um, so in terms of coverage, he was broadcasting on the major stations. He had, it, so the ZB had a much larger listening audience than the YAs did just because it, it catered to, it catered to rural audiences way better than the national one did. It, for instance, it played um, local notices on the local stations which the YA didn't do. They tried to keep it all very streamlined and linear. ZB catered to what was going on around them. Um, we, he got a wealth of fan mail in the 1940s, and that's how I know that he was well listened to. You've got letters appearing in the listener. You've got letters written to him at the Department of Health. They still exist. Sadly, I don't have any that exist after, um, but there's a huge... No, I think I've got like 250 from a three year period for the 1940s. That's massive. Um, and I actually, I put out a call earlier this year in the listener asking people who remembered him to contact me so that I could use this in my thesis. And I had uh, 14 responses from people who remembered and could quote, they would remember specific things from his talks. Okay, I remember this advice, I remember that. I passed on this advice to my colleagues because it was so good. Um, and there seems to be, he published three books as well, which were sold. So these were his talks put into little book format for the home. In terms of whether there can be a modern equivalent, well, this is a really interesting discussion because our way we consume media has changed so much, particularly for people of my generation. Um, you need to change how you, how you approach that, how you educate people about health but also bringing back some of these public health messages that have kind of become forgotten. I mean, we don't talk about anti-spitting anymore, but when tuberculosis was an issue, it was a massive thing. There were posters, there were talks about it, a lot about why you don't spit in public. Um, hand washing, sniffing, all sorts of things. Could there be a modern equivalent? Yes. Are there people claiming to be radio doctors? Yes. But the way that they tend to work is it's an entertainment thing, not an education. Mm -hmm. So there are people texting in, oh, I've got a strange lump, what could it be? And it's all a bit, it's all a bit scandalous. Um, it's for entertainment value. There could be a place for someone to come in and do something very similar, but probably not in the format of radio. Uh, maybe a podcast, which is, or YouTube ads, I don't know. Um, but it, it's interesting how we think about how public health education communication has developed and what's our next phase and how do we continue to engage with the ordinary person in a meaningful way. 
No, I, I do suspect women's magazines have not changed a lot. <laughs> um, and yes, some of the, talking about nutrition in particular, the amount of misinformation and people not understanding what nutrition meant. Because women's magazines, they're all telling you a different thing. They're all giving you different recipes and different claims regarding what a vitamin does or doesn't do. And nutrition manufacturers, even worse. Even worse, they're all promoting misinformation in the 40s. Um, so they're claiming that a vitamin does this thing before studies have actually proven anything or before studies have really even gone on. It's fascinating. Yes. How big do you feel uh, deal with feminism? <laughs> well, another injury hard. That's a hard hitting question. Um, what, we, what I see looking at this is that he, first of all, I talk about the perceived audience in the 40s. I've got fan mail from older gentlemen asking how to turn their hair back to its normal color. I've, so I've got evidence of men listening to these talks in the 40s. Feminism comes in. Um, he is very much a supporter of women going into the workforce, but also the housewife that chooses to remain at home. There's no judgment. There's nothing. And that's particularly interesting when you have women facing critique for choosing to work. And he's... Uh, his talks are always very balanced, that neither is right or wrong, that it's just about health. It's not about anything else. And even when it's talking about parenting, so in the 50s there's this, the Mazengar report which claims that all these unruly teenagers are because mothers are entering the workforce and not giving their children enough attention. He's very much like, well, actually, this is about discipline. It's not about a, you know whether someone's working or not. It's about consistent discipline. Let them have some leeway, but keep your boundaries, stick your horses, um, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting in that he doesn't necessarily get super down that rabbit hole, but tries to remain very balanced the whole time, uh, but then the contraceptive pill he believes women should know about, they should have the right to know, and he gets cut down by the senses instead, so. Very wonderful talk, we uh, look forward to your book. Okay, so you said you might put it all together. Oh, yeah. Really? It'll be a fascinating read. Look It'll be a long read. <laughs> Join me. Thank you. Thank you.